Great, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be um, in this panel and talk a little bit about um, this continuum concept. Certainly when someone becomes pregnant or a couple contemplates pregnancy, they don't think about the great divide between the obstetrician caring for the baby and the pediatrician caring for the baby. They're looking at this as a continuum and a, an outcome that they start their pregnancy and hope to have a healthy child. So I think it's important a nice opportunity to take a minute to think about uh, how a family may navigate this entire endeavor. And I will try to um, reflect on some of the similar um, issues as Dr. Baudet. Um, and I'm going to do it from the standpoint of a practicing OB geneticist in the Bronx. So I do this a couple days a week. And I don't want to sound like doom and gloom, but I just want to suggest that it's a little trickier than it sometimes um, looks at first glance. And I'm going to sort of point that out with the idea that it's a bit of a cautionary tale for what might be were we to multiply it by um, 4 million um, samples a year. So I'm going to look at some of the very same conditions that we just talked about, expanded carrier screening, screening and diagnosis for aneuploidy, and screening and diagnosis for microdeletion, microduplication syndromes. And I'm going to start similarly on this idea of an ex expanded panel of carrier conditions, such as is currently offered by Council, which just illustrated over 100 conditions um, with varying disease prevalence. But I think it's important to point out right up front, there's very differing sensitivities and specificities for these conditions. So some of them are only like 60 excuse me, 50 to 60 percent sensitive. So it's really important to remember and think about residual risk because you can go through prenatal and be told everything's negative but still have, you know, a, a residual risk that's not insubstantial. I think in genetics we get used to that fact that what we do is rare. So just how rare is, you know, rare enough to be off the table, but some patients each year are going to have negative screening tests but retain residual risk and have affected children, and I think that's important to remember. It really is way off the radar of any individual who goes through the process who's just looking for a reassurance that everything's negative. Um, another issue would be the um, concept of functional testing versus mutation testing, and this is really quite acute with the issue of Tay-Sachs disease. If you have a non-Jewish individual, then just doing mutation testing for the Ashkenazi Jewish mutations is not appropriate or is not good enough. It's not the best you can do. And there was a New York or a, a reporter who had an affected child in this same instance. She was um, of Irish ancestry and had testing, but only had mutation testing, and the child was born with Tay-Sachs. So I just to put a few numbers on it. Basically, you'll miss 11% of Ashkenazi um, uh, uh, Jewish carriers if you don't offer enzymes. So you can bring the residual risk down. You can basically bring it um, into, you know, bring it down by half. And so if you have one individual, for instance, mom comes to you and she's a known carrier. Now you're coming up with a testing strategy for the partner. You really need to think about that. These are sort of intricacies that in newborn screening could um, get somewhat lost. The other thing to remember, though, and this is a continuum issue, is that many times we will offer mom carrier screening, either basic panel or a council extended panel, and then for a variety of reasons, the father of the baby's not available, and it's not an infrequent um, circumstance. So we'll see couples heading into the newborn screening period with a lot of concern about an identified carrier um, in the couple and no resolution. So they sit for the whole second half of their pregnancy, like 22, 24 weeks, anxious. And it, it's really very sad and upsetting to sort of put people through this and not be able to help them to resolution. So as they come into newborn screening, they may have one thing on their mind. It's this sort of unresolved carrier issue. They have oftentimes put in some significant financial resources to try to attain the carrier screening. Usually the father is the second one to be tested. And if insurance won't pay or they can't get their insurance, and it may, they may have, in fact, spent some money and not been able to get it done. So a family's looking for reassurance as they go into the newborn screening period. There's often a lot of confusion about what was tested for prenatally and what's in the newborn screening panel. And as we move into multiplex panels, it's really kind of tricky, like, well, why is cystic fibrosis on both panels? And why isn't Tay-Sachs on the um, newborn screening panel? And sort of there's some intricacies there that are actually confusing for clinicians and certainly confusing for families. Um, I've always thought about this. If you go into a pregnancy, as a known carrier, shouldn't you be outside of routine screening as a newborn and be right into a more extensive evaluation? So in the case of sickle cell, we'll say, oh, well, the baby will be screened at birth, but if you are going into newborn screening period with a 25% risk of having a hemoglobinopathy, 
to me, you should come out of routine risk screening pool and into at least some evaluation. But you know, these are questions that aren't precisely worked out. Or if you have, uh, you know, different hemoglobinopathies, and we're seeing more and more of that as an example in the Bronx, or we have huge immigrant populations, we're seeing a lot of alpha thalassemia, beta thalassemia, and in various combinations. So lots of um, sort of continuum issues where it would be better to come out of just screening and into clinical care of a mom, a couple, and a baby, um, and bringing that into the pediatric care. Um, I think the last point has been uh, covered. I'll move on to the next issue, which is screening and diagnosis for aneuploidy. And in fact, screening and diagnosis for aneuploidy, Down syndrome in particular, is what we spend a lot of time talking about from about eight or nine or 10 weeks gestation till about 16, 17, 18 weeks gestation. And it's really complicated. It's changing a lot. We have first trimester screening, quad screening. We still have CVS and amnio because we still recommend diagnostic testing in the setting of any positive screening test. And now we have non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT or NIPS. And you know, the question with that is, is it a really great screening tool for one or two or three conditions, trisomy 21, 13, and 18, and now maybe getting more into the sex chromosome aneuploidies? Or is it a not so great diagnostic test for a whole bunch of conditions? And you know, we could spend hours just on that topic, but you know, the other thing is that it's changing. So the, the technology that's available today will be better in a year, will be better in five years. But throughout all of this, it's hard for practices to adapt. And then it's hard for women to really make well-informed decisions. So now many women come in and they, you know, no woman comes in and says, what I really want is a needle in my belly and I want you to take out fluid. That's what I want. You know, like, of course nobody wants that and nobody wants the risk of a miscarriage. But it's balancing how much information you're going to get with what risks are worth taking and with what certainty. And it's pretty complicated and challenging to even have the numeric data and then for women to act in that, to sort of assess the, what's in their best interest. Um, I would suggest that by the time women end up through 18 weeks and they're done with us, we've had as many appointments as they need with us in genetics, they kind of have the message the baby's fine. And that's sort of where they want to end and land, and we like to get them there. And then they're going to go for 22 more weeks and have a baby. So to then be faced with a positive newborn screening test can really be, you know, quite shocking and really, you know, take people out of their comfort zone that, well, I went through all this, I endured all this testing, I think things were fine, and how could this happen? Especially then a false positive can be very emotionally upsetting because it, it, it turns out then not to be nothing. So I think patients often experience this as sort of very alarmist. The screening tests make them upset and then the diagnostic tests are reassuring and they just can't understand what we're doing in genetics. Like why can't we get it right? Why are we, why do we do it in this fashion? So that concept of screening and diagnostic testing, it's hard to live through. I'll get in now to chromosome microarray analysis, and this is sort of the bleeding edge, and we're implementing it in our clinical practice. I would suggest that the variants of uncertain significance are huge, are, you know, have been reported in saw a few qualitative studies how difficult and challenging they are, but are still somewhat underappreciated in the clinical landscape. Um, if you have a kind of individual who is an information seeking either mom or couple and they come in and they want everything so then they have a diagnostic test and they opt to have the chromosome microarray analysis, that's the kind of um, personality style who doesn't usually do too well then with a variant of uncertain significance. So you sort of have a really bad match between the kind of person who wants this and opts for the most information and the type of results that you return. So that's a big challenge. The counseling is extremely time consuming and anxiety provoking. It really rarely comes to resolution. And then families can enter the newborn period with a sort of sick child syndrome or watchful waiting or anxiety. You know, and the pediatricians report to us that these kids are brought into their office like, you know, China dolls with this, so much anxiety from the families. The health outcomes we really don't, I would suggest don't even know yet because some of those studies don't have enough follow up long term data. Um, uh, Bernhard et al. reported on some of the um, qualitative work they did with women who were in the NICHD trial that they considered some of this toxic knowledge. So I'd say the variants 
will be worked out over time, but we really need prospective data with which to interpret those. And for the moment, that just the data sets don't even really exist. So to take pediatric data sets where we have microduplications and microdeletions identified in affected children and then to sort of try to repurpose them to prospective data sets for prenatal use, it doesn't, you know, the, the data is not really valid and we just don't have that yet. Now there's some consortium work, there's plenty of consortium work going and I think that when that data is available, it will be a valuable resource but in the, for the moment, we're acting clinically with a lack of data and that's very tif difficult for clinicians and for patients. Um, other things that I could see coming up as if we were to go into whole genome sequencing, um, the need to um, evaluate parental samples. So if you get a newborn screening variant, then you'd start to need to pull in parents and certainly that's what we need to do in prenatal. And so to scale that up to newborn screening I think would be challenging. Um, we in our clinical practice have found benign familial variants to be extremely common and as my colleague pointed out before, maybe they're not so benign. We've def we, um, made a diagnosis of Charcot-Marie Tooth in a um, fetal sample and then made it actually in a father. So that's a challenge too. You're going to have a lot of incidental findings to parents. Do, who's going to evaluate these parents? Are they healthy? Are they not healthy? Again, manageable maybe for the moment, but certainly <coughs> real concerns if we scaled up to population-based um, offering of such testing. Um, I talked about the, the need for additional data um, for prospective risk prediction, Pro you know, population-based data, as Nancy pointed out in one of her very first slides. We just don't have that yet um, to be used in prenatal. Um, and what we found was that CMA in our setting has been most useful in the setting of abnormal ultrasound findings. So it starts to take it out of an otherwise completely unhealth, uh, excuse me, healthy, uncomplicated pregnancy. Screening in that setting has been, um, or CMA has been uh, less well, um, uh, found to be less um, useful versus in the setting where a family had an abnormal ultrasound, structural anomaly like a cardiac anomaly or other finding, CMA was found to be quite useful, better tolerated, better response, people liked it better. So that is again the idea that some of these um, broader um, CMA, whole exome, whole genome may be better used in the case of an evaluation of an affected either pregnancy or child or um, anywhere along the spectrum as opposed to being offered to all people with no previously demonstrated increased risk. And this was borne out in the uh, big um, NICHD public published study in December where basically CMA revealed um, six per, in 6 percent of um, cases there were clinically significant results in the setting of an ultrasound anomaly. And um, so, you know, we, we, we found this exact um, issue consistently and so again would be the idea there would be that this technology would be useful in the setting of evaluating a pregnancy with some finding as opposed to just being offered to all pregnancies where the, for the moment, and this is my personal bias, the risks generally have, I have seen to outweigh the benefits. Yeah. What, what risks are you talking about? The risk of loss of pregnancy? Well, so I can only report on our, what I'm, what I have in my head that I've you know, submitted whatever, we had 22 findings in the first six months, only one pregnancy terminated and not even for CMA. So what I'm talking about and just from my personal experience is the uncertainty, put it, you know, uncertain information at 18 weeks gestation when you have to decide about terminating a pregnancy, it's not an insignificant issue. It is a huge risk. And so the value add that we saw to patients was mo very modest. Um, because in the absence of an ultrasound finding, we found patients hesitant to act. Other thoughts on that? Um, so just to kind of reiterate a tiny bit more about this uncertainty, um, as, as I've said in a couple of these scenarios, really very different to have uncertainty when you have to make a decision about terminating a pregnancy as opposed to you have a child and you want to care for that child. So uncertainty weighs very differently in those two scenarios. So to actually compare them I think is uh, not bringing into consideration the, the very different set of considerations that a patient um, assesses prenatally. Um, we really need more data to interpret the results and to be able to give some accurate risk prediction. Um, it's very hard to sit with a family and say, we found something, we really don't know what it means. Like, it, it, it feels really terrible. It's almost like a, 
as a clinician, you don't usually do that. You don't usually offer someone something and then leave them hanging. It just doesn't feel good professionally, and I don't mean to sound too simplistic. I'm just saying that's, I'm not sure everyone gets that that's what we're doing unless you do it. Um, this kind of testing would need extensive pre-test genetic counseling and then significant post-test counseling for those with findings. So we would certainly fall into some workforce issues and availability of genetic counselors. And we really need more educational materials about what, what this means and, you know, starting to kind of explain the whole issue of CMA and then to get into whole exome, whole genome is going to be challenging and is going to take, I think, some community-based work to really come up with ways of explaining that are resonant and make sense to folks. Um, and then, you know, for the moment, I've seen personally the toxic knowledge a little bit overweigh the utility of this for many, many families. And so I would just suggest that while this, none of this is to say we should stop the uh, progress, we should, I think, consider it and then think about scaling it up, because if we scale up the good uses of this technology, we're also going to scale up the problems. And I would say um, my thoughts would be to look at them a little bit more before we do that. Um, and then finally, just the kind of contemplative question, couple questions, the prenatal versus newborn. You know, prenatally, is an improved health come about informed decision making or fewer affected infants? Because regardless of how much technology and how much diagnostic information we provide to families, they're going to make a decision at you know, 18, 19, 20 weeks. And that's based on their background, their culture, what they bring to the table. So there's no, to me, it's about informed decision making and we wouldn't be able to actually demonstrate better outcomes by counting babies. Um, in the newborn period, we'd have a different set of questions. What's an improved health outcome? Well, certainly an early intervention. I don't think anybody um, argues with an early intervention that would improve the child's health, but is knowledge alone useful? And then if we have uncertain prediction, then how much has the knowledge helped versus hurt? And I don't think we have the answer to that. Um, and then the last question is, should prenatal and newborn screening panels somehow be aligned? And what would that look like? And you know, no one really thinks that way because not too many of us think across that New, you know, prenatal to newborn screening period. But I think from a patient perspective, certainly there should be maybe some consideration to that, at least pointing out why some conditions are on both panels and why some are not. And again, as the possibilities become larger, I think we will see more overlap.